So we have shifted in terms of water availability from when the RMA was written, from being an abundant resource to being a constrained resource. You now have run of river takes being on restriction. You have also got the groundwater zones in Canterbury at allocation limits. And as Mike has been demonstrating, if you look at water quality and freshwater ecology, there has been marked deterioration. We're now starting to see the impacts of the cumulative effects of land use intensification and diminished flows. And it's not just the, the water quality, it's the reduction in flows as well. If you look at some of the key RMA decisions that occurred, and this is prior to the finalisation of the Canterbury Water Management Strategy, and I've just picked two examples. <coughs> One was the Environment Court decision in relation to Linton Dairy. They effectively disregarded the groundwater allocation limits that were set um, in the regional plan for Canterbury. What they said that there was no probative evidence of adverse effect. If you look at the volume of water that was going to be abstracted, it was about 2% of the groundwater basin, and that's a reasonable amount. But you can only measure impacts 2 plus or minus 5%. So the court argued there is no probative evidence of an adverse effect. Therefore, it is acceptable to grant the consent. The fact that there's conservation of matter and water flows downhill doesn't seem to be probative evidence in relation to the environment court. If we then look at an example, that was for water quantity. I now want to look at water quality. If we look at the hearing commissioners, this is, this is the RMA hearing commissioners for central plains that allowed further intensification. They did something quite unusual in relation to the hearings. They actually got a section 41 report, an independent report, um, that was put to the commissioners. And what it demonstrates, and this was certainly consistent with the evidence coming from both sides, that in the Selwyn area, downstream of the Central Plains area, you already had 5% of the groundwater bores that were exceeding the drinking water standard. The perifyton guidelines had been exceeded. The macrophyte guidelines had been exceeded. The nitrate chronic toxicity levels have been exceeded. And if you look at where the ultimate source or endpoint of the nitrates would be, it would be in Taiwan Hora Lake Ellesmere. That trophic lake index would increase from 7, which is hypertrophic, to 7.2, and people are trying to get improvements. And it was argued by the hearing commissioners that this was acceptable under the RMA. We do not have a piece of legislation that deals with cumulative effects. It wasn't designed for that, to be fair to the people who designed it. We actually need something different that deals with cumulative effects. One of the issues that uh, Diana mentioned is, what can we do about this? So one of the things we certainly tried in relation to Canterbury was getting collaboration occurring um, in relation to how to improve water quality and also the overall outcomes in terms of flows. And we started work at the tributary and at the catchment scale. And I've just got three examples here from that work. There was a proposal to dam the Arari River. Through a collaborative process of working with the people in the catchment and also with the potential applicant, they realised that this was going to be unacceptable in terms of what the community output would be, and they changed the concept to having an off-river storage, taking water from the Rangatata from high flows. So a totally different concept in terms of how to get access to water. The second example I've got there is the Pahau catchment. There have been some major algal blooms that occurred at the mouth of the Hurunui, and the Pahau is a, a tributary of the Hurunui. And it was demonstrated by the Environment Canterbury scientists that the major source of nutrients was coming from the Pahau. We went out there with a voluntary approach, explained to the farmers that they were the major cause of the problem. They said they didn't wish to be the pariahs in the community and actually put in place, without any uh, reference back to the RMA, a whole range of uh, measures to improve water quality. 
And in the first five years, they had a threefold reduction in bacterial contamination. They had half the phosphorus coming into the river system. And we were starting to see changes in the nitrates. The nitrates take a bit longer um, because you have um, a greater time delay in terms of the groundwater system. What we then tried, we said, well, if it works at the catchment scale, can it work at the regional scale? And that was the whole concept of setting up the Canterbury Water Management Strategy. To deal with some of the issues that you need to bring land use and water use together, this was driven by um, the Canterbury Mayoral Forum, and we also had a multi-stakeholder group that contained a whole range of interests, from farming interests, irrigation interests, to the conservation and uh, fishing and recreation interests. A strategic framework was developed, but rather than being specified by the regional council, it was based on stakeholder and community engagement. The implementation programs are now being developed through the region and zone committees. It had to be done under the Local Government Act. Um, that actually gives local government authorities until the changes that occurred in 2012 to actually take proactive actions to deliver on the multiple pillars of sustainability. But it was then, you have to give it statutory backing, and that has occurred, or is in the process of being, uh, occurring through the land and water plan. What we got was a shift from the concept of looking at improving water availability to address the uh, drought conditions that occur in Canterbury um, through storage on alpine rivers, to having targets for 10 community priority areas related to water. If you look at the sustainability appraisal of the strategies, and this is more than just looking at the assessment of environmental effects, there was a definition of a sustainability bottom line. When we looked at the sustainability bottom line and what you'd call business as usual under the RMA, it was not sustainable. There was an environment-led option that was considered, and that scored well on the environmental criteria, but was below the economic bottom line. There was a storage-led option that scored well on economic criteria, but was not um, giving you a satisfactory environmental bottom line. What really had to happen was to look at existing uses as well as looking at any potential new development. And there was effectively an efficiency there option that scores above the bottom line on nearly all of the criteria, whether they be um, social, cultural, economic <coughs> or environmental. If you look at some of the key conclusions coming out of that sustainability appraisal, one of the key things that it's only possible to achieve sustainable development by considering existing uses as well as new uses and projects. Mm. And of course the RMA is actually focused on new development, not on mm. existing uses. Also we found that the most economic viable source of additional water would come from a efficiency gains from water that was already allocated, rather than coming from storage. If you're going to meet the environmental requirements, it was best met by improved land use practices of not just new users, but existing users as well. There is no capacity for further development unless the cumulative effects of existing use are reduced. It was also identified that you can't rely on just applicant-driven components. There is a need for parallel development of environmental restoration with water development. And that's led to the Immediate Steps Biodiversity Program uh, that has been funded by the Council and getting support from both industry and centre. 
One of the systems that was important was having a nested system of management. The concept in the strategy was to have a tripartite forum at the national level, which would include Maori central government and regional government. At the regional level, to have a regional committee and a regional implementation program. At the zone level, to have zone committees and zone implementation programs. Have sub zones which have farmer collectives and a requirement for an environmental management strategy. At the property level, to have farmers and farm environmental plans. So, a very different concept of giving greater responsibility but also clear environmental outcomes that had to be achieved in relation to um, the zones and the farmer collectives. One of the interesting things is to compare what has been happening with the outcomes of some of those processes. One of the interesting issues is the nitrate limit in the Hiranui catchment. If you look at the estimate of the current load, it's between, um, it's around about 693 tonnes per year. The scientists advised to the zone committees that it should stay at 693. The zone committee draft recommendation to the council was for 693. Dairy and Z then lobbied the Environment Canada Commissioners, and it was raised to 832, mm -hmm. and then went to RMA hearing processes, where it was raised again to 963. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at the outcome, we're certainly getting a better outcome from the zone committees than we are from RMA processes. Limits are a necessary but not a sufficient provision for sustainability. The National Objectives Framework is helpful, but certainly as it's been indicated by Mike, the bar is too low, the time frame is too long, and the coverage is in, incomplete. I mean, MCI is not a requirement in relation to the National Objectives Framework. If you're going to have sustainability, you need to be looking at system resilience, recovery when limits are exceeded, and adaptability to changing circumstances. And the RMA, and certainly the current institutional arrangements, don't address those issues. If we look at the, one of the other alternatives, looking at drinking water, where you have the District Health Board owned public health units, a mixed model of governance with four appointed and seven elected representatives. You have central government oversight of the regulatory functions, and you also have the water supply treatment distribution mainly by territorial authorities. If you look at the action forcing mechanisms that exist under that legislation, you have drinking water standards, grading of supplies and distribution, water safety plans, and asset management plans. The next slide will show you a map of the drinking water status in Canterbury. Um, if you have something that is acceptable in terms of drinking water, it shows up as green. Um, if it's close to being acceptable, it's um, pale green, and then it gets to yellow, orange, and red, which is unacceptable, grey, which is ungraded. There are only three points on that map that are actually green. One is in Kaikoura, one is covering most of Christchurch, and the third is at Waimani. The rest, we actually have unacceptable drinking water. If we look at the relationships between waterborne disease and drinking water grade, this is some work that was done for setting up the New Health Act, and you can see here a relationship between the distribution grade um, at A on the left where you've got acceptable, up to U, which is ungraded, and the rate of disease, and you can see, and that's a, an exponential um, scale, significant increases that you get in waterborne disease in relation to drinking water grades. And if you look at the results from within Canterbury, you can see that Mackenzie, and none of the facilities in the Mackenzie district meet the drinking water standards except the dock facilities at, uh, at Racky and Cook. You can see that cryptosporidium rates are 20 times what they are in Christchurch. Perinelli looks okay, but that's only because all of their water, or nearly all of their water supplies, are on permanent boil water notices. The actual water quality is unacceptable. One of the interesting things is a water safety plan, and this is based on a different concept. It's a risk-based approach rather than an effects-based approach. We haven't seen the results of this yet, but in terms of the concept, it is a much more robust concept. It's based on what's called hazard analysis and critical control points. It was actually developed by NASA in relation to food supply for astronauts. But there you have to look at a hazard analysis for contaminants in source, treatment and distribution, so looking at the whole system. You've got to determine the critical control points for management, establish the critical limits for intervention. But one of the other key things, you have to establish the preventative measures to reduce risk, 
corrective actions for minor events, and contingency plans for major events. You also need to have verification procedures and a range of documentation. A similar process has been used in the aquaculture water quality management. And one of the key things about this which differs from what happens in the RMA, I think it is much better to have a legal obligation to address adverse outcomes that exceed critical limits, as required by the HACCP method, rather than a legal right to extract and pollute, even though the limits have been exceeded, as under the RMA. Um, I've still got some more things to, to cover. Would you like me to continue? Yes, I think one more minute. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> there are some issues in terms of the implementation aspects of the water safety plans. Small communities are excluded despite being the most vulnerable. There's a problem of affordability for small districts. Hunui District Council have done the right thing, but they're finding the cost of implementing too great. A lot of these issues are already in place for large communities. We have seen so, some improvements in small centres after amalgamations. Franklin District is now uh, compliant, having been become part of water care. And if you look at the proposals for the Akaroa uh, water treatment plant, which was unacceptable um, when it was with Banks Peninsula, there is now an improvement schedule that will deliver the outcomes now that it's part of Christchurch City. If you look at some of the institutional responses that have occurred, and this is for urban water, we've seen water care established as a CCO for the um, Auckland region. We have an interesting variant, though, coming in terms of Wellington, where you now have Wellington water as a CCO for the city um, councils and the regional council, which demonstrates you don't necessarily need political am amalgamation to get the technical integration. There's been the work in England where there has been privatisation and the creation of 10 water and wastewater companies to run their systems to achieve amalgamation. Scotland has gone a different way. They've had amalgamation of small providers into one government statutory corporation. If you look at the research evidence, there is no empirical evidence that privatisation is more efficient, but there certainly are findings that there are economies at scale, but there's a critical level of output where the scale economies are exhausted. And that's somewhere between, different, depending on the different studies, between 100,000 connections and a million connections. There are 140,000 connections in uh, the Wellington region. One of the key things, if we're going to have sustainability, is to have a restoration component. And that requires a proactive role from government, not a reactive role, which is inherent in the RMA. If you look at what's happening with some of the late restoration programs that are being established, um, in New Zealand, there are some interesting components that exist in all of those in terms of the institutional arrangements. One is that they are intergovernmental partnerships. They usually consider central government, regional government and local government. They all include iwi government um, governance and management agreements. They have strategy groups involving key stakeholders. They have community engagement mechanisms. They also have zone or catchment implementation committees. They have technical advisory committees, and one of the other key components is that they have funding trust and financial deeds of agreement. We actually need money to implement these components. If we look at the other key component for sustainability, you need to have adaptability. You've got to be able to anticipate changing circumstances. And I use climate change as an example. And if you look at the impacts in Canterbury with respect to climate change, they are quite significant when it comes to water management. One of the key components is that with increased temperature, you'll get increased potential evaporation deficit. That's the amount of water you need to add to get optimum plant growth. That will mean you get increased irrigation demand. You'll get decreased winter rainfall on the plains, which means you'll get reduced aquifer recharge, reduced flow and stream flows. The east coast will become drier, so you'll have lower flows in the foothill rivers. The west coast will become wetter, and you actually get an increase in the amount of alpine flows but you're going to get less snowfall, so there'll actually be a change in the timing so that you'll have higher winter flows and less flows during um, spring and summer when you've got the irrigation demand. If you look at what adaptations might be needed, you'll certainly have an increased demand for water and less reliance on runoff river and groundwater. 
There'll certainly be a need to continue to increase water use efficiency and resource productivity. People will be looking for storage and potentially in a basin transfer, but the question, is storage sustainable? If you look at a potential resilient solution in relation to climate change, that would be harvesting of alpine water uh, winter flows for groundwater recharge, and also looking at the conjunctive use of groundwater and surface water rather than having them separate. But we need infrastructure coordination to achieve that. We do not have a mechanism for achieving that in the institutional framework in New Zealand at the moment. I think New Zealand is the only OECD country without a natural source or water management agency in central government. If you look at what's happening in international research in terms of water governments, some of the key points coming out are the concept of having self-managed communities more appropriate for managing water resources at sustainability limits, having nested systems where decisions are made at the smallest geographical scale that you can, having distributed network structures rather than hierarchies or markets for complex systems, so that you've got multiple interests and many interdependencies that can be accommodated, to have collaborative processes rather than adversarial processes for conflict resolution, and to have deliberative democracy rather than representative democracy. And by that I mean in terms of deliberative democracy, some of the key elements are having open community engagement, engagement with other interests and institutions to produce collective decisions, and accountability of the democratic body to the engagement outcomes. And one of the interesting components of accountability that's just come out is the ECAN report in relation to how they're progressing with the Canterbury Water Management Strategy. That is consistent with the deliberative democracy, and if you look at all of those principles, they are some of the guiding principles in establishing the Canterbury Water Management Strategy. If we look at what's happening in water legislation, the concept that water is a public good held in trust by the governing body is becoming an increasing component. And we heard some of that last night. And I gather we're going to hear some more about the public trust doctrine um, later on. If you look at some of the other changes, looking at having allocation processes to incorporate environmental assessment water plans and ecological needs, New Zealand is doing that. If you look at some of the other things that, look, uh, that are happening internationally, pursuing opportunities for water efficiency gains without neglecting equity and third party effects. People have been looking at markets, but they do have problems in terms of equity and uh, third party effects. If you look at what's happening with capturing the land water connection, there's some very interesting changes that are occurring elsewhere. I mean, the EU directive in designating nitrate vulnerable areas is one example, and that's now happening in Canterbury. The Flemish region of Belgium requires a water assessment before land use permit can be granted, and even in Andhra Pradesh in India requires rainwater harvesting for groundwater recharge in its building code, which would have been very helpful in the Christchurch rebuild. One of the other things is looking at ensuring use of participation in decision-making implementation, and we're starting to see that come in in South African, Brazilian, Mexican, and many other countries. And also, one of the things that we talked about last night, addressing the interface between customary and statutory water rights. This has happened in Namibia, in Chile, in Paraguay, and Tanzania. This is it. So, just in terms of, of conclusions. The current institutional relations we have in New Zealand are based on issues of the 1980s. The circumstances have changed. We need to consider alternative institutional arrangements. Effects based within environmental limits is not sufficient when we have resources at their sustainability limits. The risk-based approach that we've seen with HACCPs is an improvement, but it's not sufficient for dealing with recovery and adaptability. The regulatory role for government is not sufficient. We need a proactive role if we're going to have recovery. We are starting to see some of the instances, institutions for proactive change emerging in New Zealand. But with, if we're after integrated water management, we can't rely on applicant-driven development. Um, it's unfair for that to occur. We certainly need infrastructure coordination to adapt to changing circumstances. 
International research is showing that the concepts of self-managed communities, collaborative processes, nested systems, network structures, and deliberative democracy are more likely to achieve the outcomes. And we're starting to see some of the changes in legislation to deliver on sustainable water management coming nationally. Thank you very much, and sorry for taking more time.